Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening um, for our presentation on owls and old growth. I'm really excited for this um, personally. My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Ochoco Mountains Coordinator for Oregon Wild um, in our Bend field office, and I'll be helping behind the scenes for this webcast. Um, for those of you who are new to Oregon Wild, we are a statewide environmental conservation organization, and we are dedicated to protecting and restoring Oregon's wildlands, wildlife, and waters as an enduring legacy for future generations. Um, a brief overview of our program tonight. We have some really amazing presenters that I'm very excited for. Um, first up, we're going to hear from wildlife and landscape photographer Rhett Wilkins, who has been a star in our photo contest for many years, and he's got some great pictures to show, share with us, as well as some stories. Um, after that, we're going to hear from David Mill Drexler from Walla Wallagy Natural History Discovery Center, who's going to talk about the ancient forests of Eastern Oregon. And then after that, you'll get a brief campaign update from Rob Clapp, and who is our Northeastern Oregon Field Coordinator. Um, and then after that, there will be time for questions and answers, as usual. Um, at any point in the presentation, you can enter your question or comment um, through this webcast software. So if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, there should be a little question mark inside of a kind of a bubble thing. Um, and you can type it in there. It'll go to me, and I will um, kick those questions to the presenters as we have time um, afterwards. And try not to get your questions in all at the last minute because it's hard for me to get through all of them at once. So as things pop up, just put them in there and we'll get to as many of them as we can and lump together ones that are similar. Um, a, a video of this webcast will be emailed out tomorrow and it'll also be posted on our website, OregonWild.org in the Wild blog. Um, so you can share it with friends and family or anyone else that you think is interested. Uh, if at any point you uh, are having technical issues, if your screen freezes or you can't see the slides anymore, just close out of everything and then go back to the email that you got about an hour ago um, and then just click that link and it'll bring you back in. And many people bought tickets for our raffle. Thank you so much. We appreciate your support more than we can say. Um, not only does it help us put on events like this, but it also funds our important conservation work. Um, some people were buying raffle tickets last minute, so we're gonna announce an email or, or contact the winners tomorrow so we don't accidentally uh, leave out anybody who just bought tickets right before this. So watch your email. Um, and then next week, uh, we will have our second installment of discussions on systemic racism in public lands, um, which is another conversation led by a founder of a partner organization of ours, Soul River. Um, Chad has lined up some legendary people to have a conversation with about uh, kind of the history of racism on public lands um, and some discussions about the future as well. Uh, so I hope that you can join us. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, and you can sign up now on OregonWild.org. There will also be a link in the follow-up email that you'll get tomorrow with the recording. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Rhett, and then the rest of us can turn off our cameras and microphones and <coughs> a little bit. <coughs> okay. Uh, how am I looking there, Jamie? Sorry, I'm putting you in presenter mode right okay. now. Okay. Okay. Oh, and I can actually see myself here too. Okay. Um, does that look good on your end, Jamie? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much to Oregon Wild for having me uh, participate in this. Um, it's quite a pleasure for me. So I'm just going to dive right in here. Um, my name is Rhett Wilkins, and I am an owl photographer. Um, uh, a little bit about me. I am currently a wildlife biologist and a student and a nature enthusiast. Um, I used to be a really hardcore avid bird watcher and then I became kind of an owl nut. Then I became an owl photographer. Now I have actually branched out from that and I'm shooting all kinds of nature scapes, uh, waterfalls, landscapes. Uh, I still shoot owls, uh, plant life, etc. And I've been doing this stuff in the Pacific Northwest for about 10 years. Um, this photo absolutely demands an explanation. This is uh, photoshopped. Um, it, I do not steal baby barred owls from the woods with the parents chasing me. Uh, a couple of friends of mine who are probably watching this right now laughing their heads off put this together as a prank to humiliate me and they did a great job. And it turns out I love the image so thought I'd share it with you. 
Um, so before we get started with the photos, just a couple of general tips on owl photography. I'm going to let you guys just read through the list because um, we are kind of pressed for time with how much I'm going to try to get through in terms of showing you pictures. But I do want to go ahead and verbally just highlight the first one. So if you're thinking about getting into owl photography, uh, the number one thing that you've got to start with is uh, learning about the ethics of interacting with wild owls. So owls are, are particularly sensitive. Um, it's particularly sensitive family of birds, more so than a lot of other species, because uh, they're primarily nocturnal, most of them. And uh, they're just not uh, accustomed to having humans kind of barge into their areas when they're resting, which is in the daytime. So um, you absolutely need to study a little bit about this, do some homework, talk to other people who have been doing it, learn about the different species and, and the behaviors and personalities of those species, because every species has their own personality and own way of operating. And, uh, and this should be your foundation. If you can do this, you're going to you're gonna um, be a lot less likely to stress the birds out and a lot more likely to get good photos. So diving right into the owls, uh, we're gonna get to Eastern Oregon for sure, but um, I do, I'm based out of Portland, Oregon, and I do about 80% of my owl photography in the Portland area. And the other 20% happens in various parts of Oregon and Washington. I travel as much as I possibly can, um, but that accounts for about 20% of my owl photography. So covering the stuff close to home very briefly, this is a Western Screech Owl. Um, on the left side, I'm going to have on every live photo this, this list, habitat range timing photo tips. And I just want to make you aware that uh, the list is very generic. Um, you can find this information on a bunch of different websites. The only thing that's unique is photo tips. That's kind of my little snippet on a tip to photograph each species. So I really want to draw your attention to the image and the photo tips. Um, so this screech owl photo was taken about 10 minutes from my house in a small urban park and <clears throat> is quite a novelty for me because uh, screech owls are very, very nocturnal. So this is a unique situation where the bird's out in, in nice daylight for me to photograph it with a rodent. I think it's a pocket gopher, but I'm not sure. And the reason this bird was out so late in the morning, and by late I'm saying maybe 8 a.m. or something like that, was because it was uh, feeding young. So this is a, a very unique shot for me. Um, this is a screech owl fledgling owlet that's probably three to four days out of a nest. Um, this actually does not belong to the bird we just saw, but it was a, a neighboring territory right next door, which is, at, believe it or not, was only 100 yards or so. We had two territories very, very close to each other, which, um, which can happen with screech owls. They have pretty tiny territories. Uh, this bird I was not able to detect, to detect in the daytime, but as soon as it got dark, the whole family woke up and the baby started begging mom for food. And so uh, my buddy and I climbed up a steep slope and um, we're able to get long exposures of this. So I do a lot of shots closer to dark with long exposure techniques, much like somebody would shoot a waterfall or the like uh, so that they could get that nice blurred water effect. Owls stay still enough that you can accomplish this if you're persistent. Another uh, owl that I shoot in the Portland area is Northern Saw Wet Owl. This is a bird that most people are gonna go to the east side of the Cascades to photograph in their winter territory where they're simply easier to locate. Um, I decided quite a few years ago that I was going to commit to learning how to find them in their breeding grounds, which is an extensive uh, rainforest, if you will. Um, and they're at higher elevations too, out of the deciduous stuff in a lot of parts of the, of the state. But in the Willamette Valley, it's like, it's like this rainforest kind of situation. So this is another one that I found uh, really close to home, about 10 minutes away. Um, finding a northern sawwood owl in a dense forest is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So it took me quite a while to figure out sort of the process of locating them. And even still today, after several years in it, uh, I would say 95% of the time I'm looking for this bird, I, I don't succeed. So uh, very difficult and very rewarding when you do get them. But um, as you can see from this photo, I was after the green, mossy, Pacific Northwest kind of feel. This is another image of a solwet. This one was taken in Southeast Washington on, in their wintering grounds. Um, one noteworthy thing about this image is all the very bright um, circles, the bokeh that you see more on the right side of the frame. 
this was an owl that was in a dark evergreen and the outside of the evergreen was really, really lit up and overexposed, um, just creating an amazing contrast. Usually that kind of overexposure is a problem. In this case, it worked out very well. Uh, Northern Pygmy Owl is another one that I try to shoot in town, but uh, like much like the Selwet, very difficult to find on their breeding grounds. I certainly find them occasionally and have friends find them who let me know about them. So I get to see them quite a bit. I get to shoot them quite a bit but getting very satisfying photos in a big, vast forest is difficult. Um, so some of my favorite photos happen to be from the east side. So this again is Southeast Washington. And um, um, this photo was another long exposure, much like that. Oh, you know what? I take it back. This was a handheld shot. This bird stayed out in the daylight, um, very inactive. We watched it for several hours. And right when it got really dark after sunset, it started moving and hunting and being active, which is very strange because it should have settled down soon after that for the night. These guys are strictly diurnal. Um, so why it was um, kind of lethargic in the day and active at dark, I don't know. It was doing the opposite of what it should do. So this was a handheld shot in very low light. Um, this photo of a big meow was taken in the Okanagan in Washington. Um, shot lots of artsy, kind of artsy photos where uh, snow is all around it, and, and the snow is kind of blurring the bird. And had some really cool shots, but this ended up being the most fun uh, for me. Um, Long-eared owl. Now we are moving into eastern Oregon and southeast Washington. So these guys can be in the Willamette Valley. I think historically, maybe in low numbers, they have bred west of the Cascades. So they might still even, but they're very, very difficult to detect. Um, and so uh, finding them west of the Cascades is a super tall order. So when I go east, I'm looking for them in winter habitat, which is usually very thick, um, willow thickets, sticky, the birds are obstructed, they're extremely difficult to find. And uh, this bird just happened to have some really lovely spotlighting on it coming through the forest. And of course, with my editing, I, I accentuated that. Um, so this shot here, Another really special shot for me because this bird is in a western red cedar. I took artistic liberties and, and sort of changed the color of the red cedar and made it really saturated. Uh, I wanted, wanted it to be a little bit fantastical with this edit, but, uh, but uh, really interesting shot to have the bird west of the Cascades in a western red cedar um, in winter. It's just not every day that you see a, a photo of this bird in this tree. A buddy of mine um, called me and said, you're not going to believe this. I have a long-eared owl in a red cedar, and uh, you need to get over here right now. I think it was about 25 minutes on Google Maps, and I said I'll be there in 15, and I was there in 15 uh, at last night. So this is a really special photo for me. Um, another example of long-eared owl in the thickets, unbelievably camouflaged. This just so happens to be my favorite owl photo that I've ever taken. Um, I absolutely adore this photo. It's such a unique opportunity to me, far more interesting than having the bird right out in the open. Uh, great gray owl. So, so this is, is really, I think, what a lot of the, the presentation is tonight um, with David and, and Oregon Wild. We're talking about old growth forests in eastern Oregon. So I've been shooting great gray owls in the Blue Mountains of northeast Oregon uh, for something like seven years. Um, I also shoot great gray owls in central Oregon, but I um, occasionally, but I far prefer going to the Blue Mountains simply because the forest is exquisite. Um, even if the great grays weren't there, I just want to spend time in this forest. So when I go, I don't pop in for a day or so. I try to pop in for three days, four days, um, several nights and just camp and hear the birds at night, see them hunt, see them take care of their young, and just really settle in and spend time with them. Uh, it's a super special experience for me and some of my friends. Um, but one thing that's spectacular about the forest that we're talking about in the Blue Mountains, um, that part of the state, is, uh, is the old growth ponderosa pines. They're absolutely massive. Um, there's not a whole lot of broken top trees with the ponderosas in that area for them to nest in. So um, biologists, have actually put up nesting platforms that are pretty famous and the owls take to those very well. But uh, what's really spectacular is that the owls have these absolutely massive trees to roost in, to hide in, to hunt from. And these trees are sort of interwoven with what I call micro meadows 
Uh, occasionally, you'll bump into a really big meadow where an owl could hunt a, an expansive piece of land. But, uh, but the whole forest is riddled with these teeny tiny meadows um, with uh, grasses that are just full of food. And so very quickly, the owl can decide it's time to hunt. Here's, here's a meadow or it's time to hide. I'm going to go right back into the woods. So um, it's kind of an ideal habitat for these birds. Um, this is, that last picture, by the way, was a male, an adult male, hunting his head off for his young. They become, they're very, very busy, the males, uh, when they're feeding young. They kind of run around like a nut. Uh, this is a female. My friends and I were sitting in a meadow, and we were just kind of relaxing. I think the female might have been snoozing. This is mom. Um, she had one chick this year. And um, all of a sudden, we look over and notice her on a stump three feet high, just relaxing, not necessarily looking at us, just looking around. She, she was uh, up in a tree and decided to come join our party in the meadow. So these birds can be extremely tame um, once they realize you're not a threat. This again is an adult male uh, hunting like crazy at dusk. Um, really nice to catch them in flight. And that's another advantage of the big forest, the big open forest with the open understory is uh, you have a really good opportunity to get unobstructed flight shots. Uh, great gray owl baby, day two out of the nest. Uh, this year, um, my friend and I were actually lucky enough to have these owls jump out of the nest right in front of us when we were there. And uh, the only thing I'll say about that is that they don't use their little tiny wings to, to slow the fall. They fall like stones and they essentially bounce on the grass and their bodies are unbelievably resilient and, uh, and they make it. It's, it's mind blowing. And this nest was probably 40 to 50 feet off the ground and they just flop with, with no, uh, nothing in between. Uh, let's see here. This is a great gray owl in central Oregon. This is one of my more um, artsy, if you will, edits. Um, this was a hunting bird in broad daylight that decided to fly directly at me and my friend from about 40 yards and land in the grass maybe 10 yards in front of us. So if I'm not mistaken, this image is not cropped. It was almost too close to photograph, but absolutely phenomenal to see. Um, this photo back in the Blue Mountains gives you a great idea of these ponderosas that I'm talking about. There's a lot of dug fur in there too, but uh, the ponderosas are just so photogenic. Um, it, it's it's uh, it's mind blowing to to get all these lines in the photo and have such a big owl uh, make these trees, um, you know, look that size. Like these trees are absolutely massive and they don't look huge uh, because this owl is huge, but these trees are big. Uh, one more photo, great gray owl, adult female, a little bit of backlighting. And I think um, I have one more slide for you. My time is almost up here. Uh, great gray owl, baby. So I don't know if this is the same baby from the photo that I showed you just a couple slides ago or one of its siblings. I think they had three babies um, from the season that this was photographed in. And this again was day two, pretty early in the morning. This is actually the same photo that somebody is going to win in the raffle for this uh, webinar. Uh, it's a different edit, but it's the same image. In fact, I think I like the old edit better, the dark one, which was um, a contestant in the Call of the Wild event. Uh, and that is all I got. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to David. Um, so, David, you are up. I appreciate you guys having me. Thanks, Rhett. Okay, David, do you have a PowerPoint? Should I move you to presenter mode? Yep, go ahead. Okay. I am switching you to the presenter. Okay. Okay, you should be presenter. All right, how is my audio? Audio is good, and I can just see a beautiful photo here. With some purple okay. flowers. So I won't see my head on the screen. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you to Rob and thanks to Oregon Wild for the <clears throat> opportunity to speak to you all this evening. I want to acknowledge the great work that Rob Clavins does here as 
the Northeast Oregon Field Representative for Oregon Wild. I work for Eastern Oregon Legacy Lands, which established the Wallaawaji Discovery Center in downtown Joseph, Oregon. Like many of my neighbors, I'm very appreciative to live in this incredible landscape. And it's just one part of a massive system of mountain ranges and canyons that stretch all the way from the Cascade Mountains to the Rockies. It's actually much more important for the conservation of the entire Pacific Northwest region than most people realize. But there's never been a holistic conservation vision for all of this area. For the past few years, I've been working on development of just that, a vision to secure region-wide resilience for the Blue Mountains. Today, I'm gonna to speak to you about the public lands component of this preliminary vision that we're still working on. I'm also gonna to touch on some thoughts on the east side screens. So my early interests in environmental science and biology took me to my graduate work at University of Montana, where I had the pleasure of working with Steve Running and other great scientists. Steve was responsible for launching the satellites into space, or one of the persons, to, to monitor vegetation growth globally. Uh, you can imagine how important that is for the global carbon cycle. Myself, I worked a lot with land surface temperature shown here. Land surface temperature is a critical Earth system data set, and it's great for understanding climate vegetation feedbacks. Vegetation is actually a very active participant in the global expression of climate and weather. Today's problems are big, and we need solutions that can match them at that scale. I think we have to be open to the functional integrity of systems since human beings have already altered the Earth system so dramatically. On the right, you see the planetary boundaries model where it attempts to look at these important indicators of a, of a, of a healthy planet for humanity with the center space in green being the target. You can see we're well outside of the safe space on a variety of indicators. Earth system scientists are encouraging decision makers and others to think about important decisions in context of all of these important indicators. They should be good for all of them. If a decision seems good, but is bad for many of these other indicators, then we should really take a hard look at whether that action is the right one to do. Forest carbon sequestration is crucial for mitigating the atmosphere carbon problem. Forests are a huge part of that. In fact, they're driving most of the land carbon sink at this time. The natural climate solutions work has been quite exciting and made quite a buzz in the literature because it shows that as we move forward in the coming decades, about 30% of our needed reductions in carbon emissions could come through both sequestration into ecosystems and the emissions avoided with good forest management. This requires that we think about managing forests to their potential state in order to reach this potential. I wanna to just touch on my experience with the 21 inch rule. For those of you that don't know, this is a east side screens, a part of the east side screens that has protected trees over 20 inch from harvest. Um, as a scientist that has worked on the ground on a lot of these issues for years, monitoring dozens of timber sales across the Blue Mountains, I've had some really unique experiences on the ground. At the far left was a, a project I worked on where 43,000 trees over 21 inches were proposed to be cut down. You can see the black paint on the trees because a previous project had removed all trees under 21 inches. Clearly, this is removing a massive amount of carbon for this system. Also note, there isn't a lot of other big trees around. So once these grand fir rem are removed, you don't have anything replacing their structure. These are the trees that are currently sustaining the ecological and evolutionary processes in this area, such as transpiration with their deep roots, such as providing wildlife habitat. When these trees die, they'll become snags important for wildlife. And when they fall to the ground, they'll become logs and eventually contribute to the dead carbon pool. These are all critically important aspects of the carbon cycle. And this really opened my eyes up to the potential for really widespread removals of large trees. 
In the lower right, you see a wet forest that's perched upon a plateau just above a very dry canyon dominated by grasslands. When species are migrating out of this hot, dry canyon where surface temperatures could easily reach 130 degrees in the summertime, a cool refuge could be just what is needed. This forest will be thinned out, and the only reason we were able to save the trees over 21 inches was because of the east side screens. I was, I was concerned and expressed my concerns about the microclimates in these forests. I call these forests that are within the Columbia River maritime intrusion zone where the moist wind comes through in the spring, the Chinook forests. They're very unique throughout the Blue Mountains. They receive a lot more moisture than other areas and they're critically important for regulating microclimates, carbon stores and biodiversity. Some of my colleagues have mapped out the priority rank for different uh, forests in the east side forests. On the right is an image that shows areas with blue and green rank either medium or high priority for storing carbon. Note in the inset figure in the lower right that compared to the rest of the interior west, these forests actually have a lot of potential to store carbon. We certainly shouldn't take that potential for granted. Interesting to hear about the talk next week on the social justice concerns and the environmental movement. I work closely with the tribe. I have the pleasure of doing so. Uh, these are their lands. Um, I tell my kids when we go to Wallawa Lake that this place was under two miles of ice and the Nez Perce were here. They've seen incredible change in this landscape beyond what short-term historical baselines can tell us. I think a robust approach that would involve all the important science, answer many of these important questions and involve traditional ecological knowledge would be appropriate to answer such an important question about how we will manage the future of our large diameter trees. Moving on now to ancient forests and intact landscapes. This map really interests me from the beginning. And this is where I start thinking about the Blue Mountains. I know these scientists, they're earth system scientists, they study disturbances worldwide. And I imagine when they, when they noticed how much of earth's forests were left um, untouched by humanity, they realized, wow, we need to map this out. Only the areas in green have been untouched by basically road building and extraction. The olive areas in green were the original extent. These areas are actually critically important for a lot of earth system function. The other areas are also important, but we need to understand the values of these remaining intact forest landscapes. Here are these values. They're vital refugia where natural, ecological, and evolutionary processes operate, things that sustain and create ancient forests over the long term. They're strongholds for biodiversity, including endangered species. They contain entire natural mosaics of ecosystems. They contain most of the remaining old growth forests buffer and regulate local climate, and the larger areas are of strategic significance, but here in the temperate zone where we live, the smaller pieces should not be taken for granted. They are very important. I like to think of these places as the healthy parts of the earth, and I think about it and relate and related to my own body, the health that I have, the really good health in my body. As you get older, we, we, we have issues that push our resilience and test us, but we have to enhance that resilience, enhance that health to keep our system overall healthy. These intact forest landscapes are part of the Earth's regional and planetary system to stay healthy. Now, if we look at the Blue Mountains, Oregon's largest ecoregion, it's a key connector between the Cascades and the Rocky Mountains, the greatest mountain ranges in the Pacific Northwest. It's a very unique in its orientation that way. As we're touching on, it's very important for addressing climate change, but also I think many of you will know that Oregon has a lot less protected area than other adjacent states. You can see that on the map where the designated wilderness is mapped in light green. Note how in Idaho, Montana, Washington, there's a lot more and bigger pieces right next to each other. Oregon has about 4% of its surface area in uh, protected as wilderness. The other states are more around 10, 12, 13. 
When we look at the Blue Mountains as a connective corridor, the migrations in motion shows really well how species, including mammals, birds, and amphibians, want to use this and use this area as a, as a gigantic wildlife corridor. Zooming in on the Blue Mountains on the right, you can see all of the different uh, tendrils or lines that reach into the Blue Mountains from the Great Basin, the Columbia Plateau, the Cascades, and into the Rockies. It's really a massive wildlife corridor, and that's how it all functions. But notice this says, this is how species need to move to track hospitable climates. It not, it's not necessarily how they can move. There are many obstacles to movement in their way. So we have to think about this, particularly when species used to have thousands of years to move, and now we're pushing these changes over just a matter of decades. So when you look at a, just a basic look at these protected areas in the Blue Mountains, we see that they're isolated, they're poorly distributed, and they're separated by huge distances. I was surprised in the Northern Blues out of the Hell's Canyon to Wanaha Toucanon, 41.3 miles apart. It has to cross private lands too. 45.9 miles between the North Fork Umatilla Wilderness and the North Fork John Day. Note that the multi-unit North Fork John Day proposal shown in the inset map has much smaller distances between the real wilderness reserves. And in the Southern Blues, generally reserves get smaller and distances are large. If we don't think about connectivity across this landscape and establish corridors between these areas, these areas could easily become just isolated places and that leads to extinctions. Species need to move and adapt to the changes that we're, we're imposing on them. The good news is that the Blue Mountains now maintain, still has 2.2 million acres of unprotected roadless areas. Here you can see them mapped in dark green. Note how they take that map, that map of the wilderness areas, and they fill it in. They connect the reserves to each other. They make them bigger. They establish new areas in between. This area still has the potential to function as an integrated system as a whole, but we have to think about how to make, help it do this. I've looked at each one of these areas in great detail, as you can see here, thinking about whether they're standalone areas, thinking about whether they're connected to existing areas, and looking at them with various data sets. I won't get into all of that, of course, but I want to show you for the greater Hell's Canyon region, a look at terrestrial resilience. That's the map on the left. You can see roadless and undeveloped land, or what you can consider as intact forest landscapes, mapped in bold black, designated wilderness in bold green, high resilience is in blue, lower resilience is in brown. Note how tightly coupled the resilience data is with these intact landscapes. Also note in between reserves um, up north in the map where these isolated places confer high resilience to a landscape. They allow, they allow the ecosystem still to function as an interconnected web of resilient habitats. Many of these areas are steep. They have rich elevational gradients and diversity of species as you can see on the right. Short movements by species can be rewarded with unique habitats these landscapes have high adaptive capacity and all the pieces they need to respond. Let's take a look at three of these roadless areas. First, the one in the middle, the top middle, Joseph Canyon, then the one in the bottom, uh, north of the Eagle Cap Wilderness, Huckleberry Mountain, and then the one on the left, the Grand Ronde River, three unprotected roadless areas. The Joseph Canyon wild horse area shown here in dark green is two actually quite large roadless areas. It sits directly adjacent to the Nez Perce precious lands marked in dark red. Further north, you see connections to other roadless Bureau of Land Management lands and off to the Grand Ronde River where, river where a web of habitats are connected along that river up to the Wanaha and the Wanaha Toucanon Wilderness. This is a landscape where we could still achieve ecological connectivity. The adjacency between the Joseph Canyon roadless area, wild horse, and the Nez Perce precious lands make this actually large intact ecosystem. Note the photos at right. 
This is where your ancient forests are, big old growth ponderosa pine stands, evolutionary processes like fire acting as they always have, and incredibly rich mosaics and wildflowers and diverse ecosystems. This is also the birthplace of Chief Joseph. This is a sacred place in which we live here. Anan, if pronounced correctly, translates to where the condors nest. This is the landscape where the condors used to ride the Chinook winds in the spring in to roost on the old growth trees of Joseph Canyon. My friend here, David Moen, pictured under a rock in the shade, is looking for habitat for condors in Joseph Canyon. The Nez Perce tribe is interested in restoring condors to Condor Canyon and the Greater Hells Canyon region. The Huckleberry Mountain Road, Lasseria, shown here, is adjacent to the Eagle Cap Wilderness and therefore functions as one ecological unit. It's a rich landscape, as many of the roadless areas next to our existing reserves tend to be at lower elevations. This area features very wet old growth forests, lots of water running through Bear Creek and an incredible trail along the river. I really enjoy these ancient old growth forests here, being a native of the west side of the Pacific Northwest. The intact forest lands of the Grand Ronde River, a designated wild and scenic river, the Grand Ronde River passes through a deep roadless canyon. In this canyon, prescribed fire has been used to continue natural disturbance processes to good effect. Lewis's woodpecker are found in here, old growth ponderosa pine. Lower, on the lower right, you can see um, bighorn sheep there. And in the upper right, passing through on a Wallawology outing on a raft, we witnessed a lightning strike. It was June, so it wasn't scary, and a fire ignited. You could see the smoke. I took that picture, which for me as an ecologist that studies natural disturbances, to see this ignition, the start of this fire was a true ecological wonder. I'm really grateful to live around landscapes where these natural processes can still function. And over on the other side of the blues, let's not forget all of the amazing habitats in between and all the way to Lookout Mountain, an area famous for its ancient Ponderosa pine forests. It's also an area with rich biodiverse habitats, a lot of wetlands and wildflowers. On our Wallawaology outings, we take people out into all of these landscapes, talk to them about what the, makes these ecosystems so important to our own personal lives. We make connections with each other, we share stories, we form relationships. Taking just a look at some of the methodology, on the, on the upper left-hand corner is the Wanaha Tucannon Wilderness in the dark green of the roadless areas. Next to that is a map that shows what's called permeability. Think of that as just a generalized measure of the ability of species to move across landscapes. Note all of these roadless areas are just dark blue, high permeable landscapes functioning totally at one with the Wanaha Tucannon Wilderness. If we look at the road systems and many other data sets, in the lower right hand corner, I've zoomed in on an area with some precision and targeted restoration, we can connect these roadless areas together and make for a larger and more whole intact forest landscape. So not just protect our intact forest landscapes, but actually, actually restore and make this ecosystem more resilient. The Joseph Canyon Wild Horse Roadless Area shown here in dark green. It's a big area, but note all of the irregular air edges. With some targeted restoration, we could provide jobs consistent with our culture, our economy, being outside, doing something healthy, and make these systems whole again. Note this area was proposed for wilderness in 1984, and it passed the US House of Representatives. All of these measures are well verified in the scientific liter literature. Increasing connectivity is commonly thought of as one of the number one things we can do to protect biodiversity and a change in climate. 
And then the Blue Mountains Heritage Trail, a vision launched by Lauren Hughes and others long ago for a trail all the way across the Blue Mountains, connecting many of its beautiful landscapes to connect people to nature and also people to the many small communities to help with ec the economic stimulation. We call this Big Wild Working Blues. It's a holistic vision to secure region-wide resilience. It would protect these roadless habitats that remain. It would provide connectivity between them. Restoration measures would be targeted and precise to enhance function and increase the size of core areas and corridors. It would retain and protect older forest, formalize the Blue Mountains Heritage Trail. The top four are consistent with protecting water in our environment. It's neat to see that there are large packages being considered at a big scale. Here's a map on the right of the current wild and scenic rivers in Oregon. Clearly, you can see that a system-wide view is needed. The effort to look at this as a holistic sy uh, system launched by Senator Ron Wyden is the right approach to take to try to secure resilience across this landscape. Many of these rivers flow through intact forest landscapes and are totally connected with those areas. Keep in mind as we think about these measures for the future, our overall goal should be to help our future generations keep their balance in a future world that they didn't create, but it's gonna challenge them. Come on into Wallowology and see our ancient forest exhibit. We're open to the public and on, actually on Fridays and Saturdays now because of the coronavirus, but we are open. Come on in and explore our exhibit. It's a really one of the most uh, precisely tailored exhibits to the forest of the Blue Mountains that, that exists. This slab here, 300 year old ponderosa pine came off of our local alder slope. I'd like to here just uh, give a shout out to my colleagues at Wallowology, DJ Lincoln, Bree Austin, Joan Gilbert, Rob Camp, others that keep the center running on a daily basis. Thank you. Thanks, David. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Rob. Rob, if you wanna turn your camera on and I'm gonna make you the presenter. Okay, give me just a second here. David, if you wanna turn your camera off, that'd be great. And can you see my single slide and my lovely face? Yes. Perfect. Well, thanks. And I would uh, echo uh, the suggestion to go check out, um, oh, sorry, just making a change here. I would echo uh, David's suggestion to go check out uh, Wallology when you come to Joseph. It's a, it's a pretty cool addition to the community. Um, so I'm Rob Clavins, the Northeast Oregon Field Coordinator for Oregon Wild. I'm based in unincorporated Wallowa County, just outside of the town of Enterprise. Um, and as uh, David talked about, it's the homeland of the Nimipu, better known as the Nez Perce tribe, who've lived here since time immemorial. And it's notable, never gave up their, uh, their claim to this land. Uh, in addition to my work at Oregon Wild, my wife and I own and operate a working farm and bed and breakfast. Um, thanks to COVID, my wife is also now a cook at Terminal Gravity, which is probably the number one public land, non-public lands-based uh, attraction in Wallowa County. Um, I'm going to try to condense a, a very important issue into a short period of time, so I'll ask all of you to forgive me for glossing things, some things over. Um, one thing I do want to note before leaving this slide, though, is that wherever you see blue paint in these slides, um, you're seeing a tree that the Forest Service has marked for cutting and, and sending to a mill. Um, I want to note um, that, unfortunately, Mike Denny was not able to make it today. Um, we're going to try to get him to do a standalone presentation on, on great gray owls um, down the road. Um, and I'm really sorry we didn't get to hear about great grays today. Um, they hold a really special place in my heart. Not only are they really cool, but the first time I ever saw one was a really special memory. Uh, in a very out of character move for, uh, for him, my father and I went up to the Sac Zim Bog in northern Minnesota during an owl eruption and saw a bunch of them. Um, he died just a few years later, and it, it really just remi remains a, a really treasured memory for me. Um, as we saw from David, uh, big and old trees are really important, not just for owls, but for all sorts of other species like swifts, bats, bears, fisher, uh, salmon, climate, and just literally dozens of species in the Blue Mountains whose populations are limited by existence, the existence of big trees. Um, and those big trees can be both healthy, they can be dying, living, um, and dead, as well as standing and, and falling onto the ground. 
Um, but as Paul Bunyan and his big axe marched across the United States from New England to Minnesota and then the Pacific Northwest, um, he cut down our forests almost indiscriminately. Um, if there wasn't any discrimination, it was with an eye towards logging the biggest trees, and Eastern Oregon was no exception. Most of our old growth is long gone. Um, and that led to the famous or infamous, depending on who you look at it, timber wars in the Northwest. Uh, in the western part of Oregon and Washington, the spotted owl was the flashpoint and the poster child for the battle over this really critical piece of wildlife habitat. And the truce there came in the form of the Northwest Forest Plan. Uh, in eastern Oregon and Washington, we got something far less uh, celebrated, but no less important, called the screens. Um, the screens were meant to be a placeholder until the Forest Service considered and implemented this whole suite of recommendations from scientists. Uh, it included strict limits on cutting big and old trees, restrictions on road building, logging, and grazing in riparian areas. Um, the Forest Service never did that as promised, and so the screens remain. Um, and a key part of the screens is called the 21-inch rule. Um, and David touched on that. And those scientists at the time recommended a 20-inch rule. Um, the, uh, the Forest Service prohibited the logging of trees over 21 inches in diameter, and that's what I'm talking about today. Uh, in addition to protecting big and old trees, the screens did a lot of other really good things. Uh, when old growth was taken off the table and the biggest trees were taken off the table, um, the screens and another, other important sideboards like the roadless rule created the conditions for collaboration and other forms of neg negotiating the terms of the truce that um, were at the end of the timber wars. Um, they also protected wildlife habitat, sequester carbon, they maintained soils, and lots more. Um, and believe it or not, like David showed, trees like the big and moss-covered grand fir you see in these photos um, thrive in, in eastern Oregon. It's not all just dry pine and desert out here. Of course, the industry and their allies never liked any restriction on logging. Um, the cycle of boom and bust that old Paul Bunyan left in his wake was already close, close to hitting eastern Oregon um, when the screens came about. Industry's unsustainable practices were necessarily leading to an end to the logging boom. Their mechanization of mills and sending logs overseas were also inevitably leading to a bust in, in timber jobs. But an environment, but excuse me, environmental protections, as we all know, make really good straw men for, for the industry and for politicians to explain away problems and avoid accountability. Also, some folks in the Forest Service want to have as much discretion as they can. And that can sound good, but it often also leads to more conflict and controversy and allows the agency to be subject to um, and bend to ever-changing political winds and also be abused by bad actors, which do unfortunately exist. And of course, there's no faster way to meet arbitrary timber targets than cutting big trees. So despite the protections on public lands, though, industry never stopped logging big and old trees on their private lands. So despite the screens, uh, the Forest Service pretty regularly proposed logging of big and old trees in specific projects. And in some very specific cases, we even agreed that dropping some larger trees made ecological sense. To be clear, looking at this photo, um, the photo on the left is something that we would strongly oppose, but cutting the tree in the foreground on the photo on the right is something that we could support. But as ever, you know, give an inch or 21 inches in this case, they, they take a mile. Um, these really contextual specific agreements were then spun to say, look, conservationists think the screens are arbitrary. Even Oregon Wild admits we need to loosen the rules. Um, and of course, industry loves to tell the half truth that the screens were meant to be temporary. What they do is skip the inconvenient part, which is that they were temp meant to be temporary until the Forest Service implemented those more holistic protections, and that still has not happened. So here we are at the end of the Trump administration's first and perhaps last term, uh, and they found a willing ally. Um, retiring Congressman Greg Walden wanted his legacy and would love his legacy to be eliminating those pesky old protections for, for his friends in industry. And we're seeing this all across the country, be it wetlands in the Southeast, mines in the upper Midwest, hunting on wildlife refuges, weakening EPA rules. This administration is essentially undermining environmental protections as fast as they can identify them. And here in Oregon, under pressure from local politicians, from the industry and others, they've, they've targeted the screens. Um, so the Trump administration and Forest Service is now rushing through what they're calling a revision of the screens. Um, often that's pronounced weakening. Um, as with nearly every effort to reduce restrictions on logging since the trademarking of Smoky Bear, it's being couched in some form of fire hysteria. Um, with nearly all the big old trees gone, especially now on private lands, now they want to start cutting big young trees uh, on public lands. There's always been an excuse, and it's usually been fire. The Forest Service, though, has tipped their hand by focusing on biased science that ignores the objections of independent scientists, uh, who rightly assert that in the absence of the return of old growth, which by definition takes more than 25 years to come back, big trees are incredibly important and they're irreplaceable. The Forest Service has also been publicly saying they're not even going to consider things like carbon analysis that might get in the way of their desired outcome, which is to log more big trees. And the goals of the Forest Service says that they want to achieve, like 
changing the composition and densities of forest or protecting communities from fire caused by fire suppression and climate change, those goals can all be achieved by thinning smaller trees and other more socially acceptable and ecologically based means. But that's not what industry or politicians want and that's not what this administration wants. So they're hoping we'll go along or that at least the broader public won't notice. So despite some attempted greenwashing and token support, the conservation community is speaking up really loudly against this process. Um, concerns have also been brought up by scientists, tribes, bird groups, uh, wildlife groups, public health organizations, environmental law firms, and more. Uh, in fact, 27 groups just submitted a letter raising some of those concerns. And um, I helped organize that letter. It was, the number of groups was only limited by the time we had to organize it. And I can tell you, it's not every day that all the little local Eastern Oregon conservation organizations are joined by big national groups like the Sierra Club, NRDC, Humane Society, Earth Justice, um, on something that just affects Eastern Oregon. This is a really big deal. Um, so the Forest Service rollout has been stubborn, stubborn as ever, despite pushback from all the groups I mentioned earlier, uh, independent scientists and more. Um, I think what was perhaps the most embarrassing misstep uh, was the Forest Service has been touting their transparency through a series of workshops. But as just one example of how ham-fisted this project has been, they held their intergovernmental workshop on an indigenous holiday so all the good old boy country or county commissioners who are thrilled to see old growth protections weekend were present, but tribal governments were shut down that day. And yet they persist. Um, they're skipping regular parts of public review. They did a rushed and biased scientific assessment that marginalized independent scientists, and they're doing it all against their own guidance not to do such things during a pandemic. Uh, in a leaked memo, the Forest Service said that if a review like this is not based on an immediate economic need, maybe they ought not do it. But the leader of the project has publicly acknowledged that if this is about economics, it won't have public support or be durable. And she's absolutely right. So the Forest Service is trying to have it both ways. And in the end, if no one is happy, they'll say they split the baby and they, they got it just right. And as the Forest Service's own leaked memo shows, they know it's a serious social justice issue, but their public response has been silence. Uh, and in private discussions, leadership has been utterly disdainful and dismissive of the notion. And that doesn't even take into account newer crises that are, are rightly occupying our time and efforts and energy as individuals and organizations all across the spectrum. Unfortunately, the administration has found some complicit voices, and some of them may have good intentions, but they've been doing tremendous damage. Um, a few really strong voices have been trying to get collaborative groups to engage in the process. And of course, the administration would love to have the cover of a collaborative, excuse me, collaborative engagement and support. Um, and as recently as last week, sadly, one collaborative group with a, notable, with a lot of notable absences of important voices did weigh in in support of the effort to revise the screens. And seeing a previously celebrated collaborative alienate the bulk of the conservation community and support something that's opposed by dozens of conservation groups and all the local conservation groups um, demonstrates just how collaboratives have become co-opted by narrow interest. Uh, it's a really big blow to the legitimacy of collaboration. And in other collaborate, collaboratives, uh, including mine here in Northeastern Oregon, it's been extremely divisive. The last two local conservation advocacy voices left the already dwindling collaborative um, just last month, leaving about five people at the table with little to no diversity among those remaining voices. And sadly, as someone who believes really deeply in the principles and the goals of collaboration, um, this process on the screen threatens to undo decades of good faith effort to find common ground, and that's really unfortunate. And yet, the administration persists. So I want to leave you with, you know, what to do. Um, the Forest Service has been publicly silent so far in response to the conservation letter and the legitimate concerns brought by other stakeholders. Um, internally, they're relentlessly pushing on. It seems they're spending more time on making sure that they're going to be able to defend their decision in court rather than respond meaningfully to public concerns. So if Trump's Forest Service is not going to listen to scientists or tribes or environmental groups or public health groups, that leaves us with not a lot of options. And that's why we need Senator Wyden and Senator Merkley to stand up for old growth and social justice in Eastern Oregon. Members of the delegation have weighed in on a number of other processes telling the agency to hold off on planning until these crises are over. And they've also opposed other Trump environmental rollbacks. And I know that it's just as exhausting for them as it is for us, but we need them to see, see them do the same thing here. At least publicly take a stand. This can't just be this obscure little thing happening in rural Oregon during a pandemic and a, a constitutional crisis. So it's been really hard to get attention on this, which is kind of the idea. Do it fast, do it while everybody's distracted, do it before this administration is over. So we need people to make this an issue. So please write letters to the editor, call your senators. Um, maybe we'll get to a point where we have to start calling Glenn Casamasa, the regional forester based in Portland. 
but please make calls to our allies, uh, Senator Wyden and Senator Merkley, who need to speak up on this. Please keep track of our action alerts for more ways um, to be involved as this continues to, ve to develop. There's, there's just a, a ton at stake here. Uh, and with that, I will um, stop because I've definitely gone over my time, which I apologize for, and see if we can get a little bit of time for uh, questions and answers of the more important people who are, are speaking today. Thanks, Rob. Okay, so now we've got all three presenters. We've still got some time for Q&A. Um, Rob, I'm going to go ahead and, and boot you from presenter mode, if that's okay. Great. And then if all the other panelists can turn their cameras and their microphones back on, and join us for a few question, answer, questions and answers. That would be great. Um, we have a lot of awesome questions and some nice notes. Thanks to everyone who is sending sending them in here. Um, maybe just a, a, a softball to get us started. Um, where do you recommend going in the Blue Mountains to see great gray owls and old growth forest? Is this for me? This is for uh, anyone anyone who has a has a recommendation. Rob, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I feel like I'm stealing your thunder here because Spring Creek is the one that jumps to mind. Um, there's a number of places where great gray owls um, are, and I've seen them um, sort of just luckily um, a number of times. And increasingly, actually, I think maybe I'm just getting more lucky. Um, but there's a place in the Umatilla National Forest um, that there is, it's publicly known. Um, there's nesting platforms. You can get a brochure at the local Forest Service office in La Grande. Um, where there's a uh, Spring Creek uh, area, there's a colony of great gray owls in that area. Um, and likewise, I'd get that information so you're making sure you're doing it in a respectful way, you're you're doing it at the right time of year, you're not disturbing the birds. Um, but I think actually part of the adventure is finding it for yourself. Red, if you've got some secrets you want to share, that's great. But I tell you, I, I find um, when you surprise yourself by coming across a, an animal like a great gray owl, that's just so much better than if somebody says, go right there. Um, yeah, so that's my, my answer. Uh, no doubt about it. I think the big thing is to uh, get a feel for the habitat by doing homework and do enough homework to, to know that the birds are in a particular area and going out and spending the time, especially if you have the freedom to camp out there and spend some significant time and listen at night and hear them and go look for them in the daytime. I mean, to me, uh, We might have lost you there, Rhett. Okay, hopefully we'll we'll get him back here, but I'm gonna go ahead and scoot over. I've got a question for David here. Um, what impact has wildfires had on the trees in the Blue Mountains? Uh, what changes have you noticed after the fires? Hmm. Well, you know, the Blue Mountains have been an ecosystem that you could say is born in fire. I mean, it, it, these these are these are fire ecosystems. So fire is kind of I think of it as is just kind of part of of, of trees in this evolutionary long term sense. Um, driving climate change leads to hotter and drier conditions and can change fire behavior. Um, we have had some some fires. In the um, uh, north, in the in the central blues, um, um, you know. But right now, I think the thing we have going for us in the Blue Mountains is we're 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 pretty um, uh, low in terms of urban development. So, you know, we have a lot of rural landscapes, and so when fires do happen, you don't hear about them as much being these huge social tragedies because. You know, we just don't have the, the great urban density that places have in a place like California. We had a fire uh, that uh, burned in the Wanaha Toucanon Wilderness and kind of came out that way. And, you know, um, after these things pass and everyone's okay, um, the impacts on the ecosystems are, are, are fine. And, and you may lose some trees, some big trees sometimes die in fire. Um, I always think to myself, you know, if if old growth trees are rare on the landscape, then it also means that the next stage of, of the life of an old growth tree, if you will, the death part is also rare on the landscape. You know, So when trees do die, they have another life and these old growth trees, they provide incredible function and habitat um, when they are burned in a fire. 
I was just in the Abnaha River of the Eagle Cap Wilderness the other day. There was a fire up there, and it's it was years ago, you know, a decade or so. But the the, the impacts are beautiful, heterogeneous impacts, mosaics, lots of big trees survived, lots of changing kind of fire intensity across the area. You know, I think a lot of people just don't understand how to quite see those ecosystems as beautiful. Um, just a message there, but I certainly as an ecologist see these post-fire ecosystems as beautiful, beautiful places. Uh, Joseph Canyon had a, had a, a little fire um, uh, and, and a big fire in 84, and today it's just a gorgeous biodiverse landscape. So I think when fire does burn, it burns in a lot of different ways. Old growth trees typically are the most fire resistant on the landscape. And uh, the good news is we're seeing a lot of diverse and good regeneration patterns after wildfire does occur. Awesome, thanks. Uh, this one's for Rob. I got a couple different versions of it, so I'm gonna lump it all together. Um, what is the, in other words, what is the succinct message that gets right to the heart of what to say to Wyden and Merkley? regarding the changes to the old growth protection rule. You're asking me to be concise, which if people know anything about me, not my forte. Um, elevator speech, yeah. not my thing. I mean, I think that, that at the end of the day, um, stop the, stop, you know, protect organs, old, big and old trees, stop the undermining the screens. Um, there's a time and a place to have a legitimate discussion about um, some of these rules, they were developed 25 years ago um, as a placeholder. Uh, but again, they were developed as a placeholder until there were more holistic protections put into place. So the idea of rushing a process through during unbelievable crises layered upon layer, um, when people can, are having a really hard time making ends meet, less, much less participating in public processes, um, at the end of a presidential term who's been extremely hostile to the environment um, and only looking at the one piece, which is the thing that protects big and old trees in Oregon, in Eastern Oregon, is just really inappropriate. Um, and so I think that that uh, we just need to stop this process. And if we're going to have a discussion about it, we can have it later. And a great example was we came really close with uh, Senator Wyden's East Side bill years ago, in which we had timber industry people, the environmentalists, including some of the most extreme you know seen as most extreme radical environmental standing side by side with timber industry executives because senator wyden had brought them together and we had come to a, an agreement that took old growth table it took the logging of roadless areas off the table but it also provided a certainty of of um, of supply to the mills so everybody got something that they wanted out of it rather than just eliminating protections or weakening protections and that's much why, like why what David's presented about, which is this sort of broader holistic vision, um, can really is really what we should be looking at, not just at the end of the Trump administration, during a pandemic, during a constitutional crisis, undermining the only protections or even reviewing the only protections for big and old in Oregon. So the short answer is not right now. Uh, stop it, knock it off. Okay, thanks. Um... So this one is for Rhett, uh, kind of clumping a few together. General um, recommendation on what kind of lenses, flash, camera stuff. Oh boy. Um, so the first thing I'll say, which I probably shouldn't say, is that I think yes, if you're getting started with camera gear, you should at least hear the statement that cameras don't take photos, photographers do. Um, so that, that said, I, you know, I think Sony has some of the best gear out there. Um, I was just having a conversation with somebody about this. I like Sony and Nikon. I use Canon gear, but I like Sony and Nikon because they both have uh, Sony sensors and Sony tends to have the best sensors. So if you're wide open, I would go and investigate Sony. But I started with a Canon Rebel. Actually, I started with a point and shoot, and then I went to a Canon Rebel. And this is bottom of the line um, digital SLR stuff that you can go into Target and get for pretty cheap. And I promise you that if you focus on technique, um, you can get a lot done with inexpensive gear. And once you know how to use that gear, then the really expensive purchases later 
makes sense because you're ready for it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's for David. What is the most interesting animal that you have encountered in the Blue Mountains? Well, um, my nephew might be watching, Sawyer, hello if you are, and he was just visiting and we he wanted to see a bear. And so we drove out to Joseph Canyon lookout on the chance that something could, like this could happen. Keep in mind in the spring time, these ecosystems just flush with productivity. And this is the time when wildlife can spread out across the landscape. They're foraging up into the hillsides. And so on the way out there, we saw a badger, which was really cool. But then from the lookout, we actually saw a black bear foraging up this ridge. We walked over to get a closer view, kind of lost it. But then all of a sudden it came out in really close view. Well, not so close that it was uncomfortable or changed its behavior towards us, but enough that we could watch it with binoculars well. And we saw it climbing down trees, uh, going up through shrubs, uh, uh, looking under logs, downed logs for grubs. It was really interesting for me because I've been developing this ancient forest exhibit that includes some downed log components where they have flip up panels. And for each panel you flip up, it shows a different organism that lives inside these down logs. And there's so many organisms that you kind of have to pick and choose what you want to show. But it was cool to see these animals out there using the habitat in that way. And every time you see a bear, it's just so cool. No squatch, huh? <laughs> <laughs> The badger's pretty great. Badgers are hard to find. Okay, I will maybe make this the last question. Um, and you know, thanks again to the presenters for your your time tonight. Um, this one might be a Rob question, but I welcome thoughts from anybody. Uh, this is from John. We have two Democratic U.S. senators, a majority of Democratic representatives, and Democratic control of the state government. Why can't we get more wilderness study areas designated as dedicated new wilderness areas? What will it take? Great question. And actually, Jamie, you could probably answer it too. And I think there's there's probably a lot of answers out there. To be clear, um, you know, when we're talking about uh, what I think you're asking about, that's federal public land. And so, well, certainly Governor Brown, legislators uh, have a role to play and local leaders have a role to play in, in raising their voices on behalf of their constituents. Um, we're really talking about federal. Um, and you're right, um, you know, Oregon, believe it or not, despite its green reputation, we've only protected 4% of our state as wilderness. And that's less than half of what even our liberal bastion that I can actually see if I look out my window of Idaho has protected. Um, we should be able to do at least as well as Idaho in protecting our, our public lands as wilderness. Um, you know, it's actually been shown time and again, the economic benefits uh, in the long term that having protected public lands have. Um, but the problem is we have, um, we have, some people have said that uh, timber is to Oregon what coal is to West Virginia, um, which is to say that it's not, uh, it, it's largely a dying industry and even to the extent it exists, it's not employing the number of people it used to because of mechanization and those sorts of things. Um, but it still has incredible nostalgic power and it also still has incredible political power. And I think a lot of people have been taught that, you know, there, if we could just get back to logging, um, logging our forests like we did back in the 50s, we could make Wallowa County great again and, and play, you know, all the places around Eastern Oregon and around the state. Uh, when the reality is that um, bringing back logging uh, is going to, is not going to bring those, those jobs back. Um, and there's this, this perception um, that it, it's become, as everything has, where we should all be able to agree on the idea of, um, uh, of conservation as something that, that isn't really political. Um, conserve, conservative, conserving places should be something we all we all agree on. Uh, but unfortunately, it's been spun into a political issue. And as we've gotten polarized, people are reflexively against things like wilderness. They are reflexively against protections for public lands. Um, and it's really unfortunate. And if we did sit down and listen, talk a little bit more, I think we better understand that having wilderness um, in 4% of the state, if we doubled that to 8% of the state, we'd still be a tiny fraction of the state that is not that is still open for hunting, fishing, camping, all of those really fun and great things. You just have to, as Eric or Fernandez, our wilderness coordinator likes to say, you just have to leave your chainsaws and bulldozers at home. They can have the other 96% of the state. 
So I think, um, you know, it's, it's a political problem. Uh, and so we just need to continue uh, to individually and collectively tell our senators, tell our leaders that we need to do better. Um, and we need to protect those places, not just where it's easy, um, not just where there's rock and ice, but the places that are important, um, like here in Northeastern Oregon, uh, where if we wanna protect wildlife at a continental scale, we have to start protecting these places. Well Jane, said. Can I, can I chime in there real quick? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. And I also think just realizing that ultimately, you know, while we we do have these problems that have stemmed from less wilderness protection in Oregon, thinking about it as just a wilderness as a tool in our toolbox to achieve this kind of larger goals on the landscape, I think we really need to move in that direction. Uh, so focusing on you know, um, large landscapes and wilderness as a tool to help secure the ability of species in a move and adapt to ch climate change across these whole regions. That's kind of the direction I think we want to move in the conversation rather than thinking about just one specific area. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. That's a, that's a great addition. Thank you. Um, I also have a bunch of other questions for Rhett, specifically about great gray owls and maybe great gray owls falling from trees. So maybe I'll talk to you afterwards and we can just write down a couple uh, answers and, and publish them with the video. Um, but yeah, thanks thanks all for hanging with us for the extra few minutes here. And, and thanks to all of our panelists for joining us. This was a really interesting presentation um, and I really appreciate your time. So thanks to all of our attendees and thanks to all of our presenters for being here. And I hope you all have a great evening. Thanks guys. Okay, see ya, have a good night.